right, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of 1 John, the New Testament book of 1 John. This is kind of an answer to a question that was asked in our question box, and so I'll be addressing that here. Yeah, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy personally going golfing. Everybody has little things they do to relax, and uh, I like to go out. Uh, I don't know that it's all that relaxing at times, uh, but you go out, and you, I know many of you might, might like to go golfing, and you know, when you're out there golfing, it's kind of like, you know, Corey mentioned the West Virginia game. Uh, you enjoy watching, but it's also painful to watch sometimes as well. Same way with golfing, it's, it's a joy to do, but sometimes it's painful. And the, the times it's painful is when you think, you know, you get out there in the course, and uh, you're ready to get up, and you're on the on the tee box there, and you're getting ready to drive, and you hit the ball, and it just sounds, feels so sweet, sounds sweet, like, man, I got a hold of that, and you crush it, you just flying out through the fairway, and next thing you know, it takes this sharp right off into the woods, and you hear it, boom, hit some trees, and, and you're just like, great, lost another one, and, and uh, you're all frustrated, so what happens at that time is... You just take another ball out of your pocket, put it back down, and that's called a mulligan. That's actually a golf term called a mulligan. And, uh, you know, we have mulligans in life. And actually what we're going to look at here is in 1 John 1 and verse 9, we're going to see God's mulligan. God gives us some do-overs, and he gives us some things where he is a gracious, forgiving God. And uh, he gives us opportunity after opportunity. And this is a familiar portion of scripture here. Uh, we often quote this verse, 1 John 1, 9, but I think sometimes sometimes we're just guilty of over-complicating uh, the Word of God. We're just making it too difficult sometimes, and there's a very simple truth here, but there are some things, uh, the question that was asked is, you know, uh, what do I need to confess and uh, you know, to God, and, and then you know, who do I need to confess to? And uh, so I thought those were some good questions, and you'll hear messages uh, over the years, sometimes we'll uh, cover the same verse, or maybe it'll be uh, a couple different messages, but it'll be from the same passage. I remember uh, Edna Martin, I would mention her this morning, uh, she would always jot down in her Bible the passage that you preached out of. So, uh, Preacher John, being here for 31 years, uh, there was, of course, some passages you just preach on. I know I have maybe five or six messages off of one little passage. And... Uh, she would always tell me after the service, she's like, you know, you preached on that that passage before. And I said, well, yeah, I know that. She goes, there's a lot more Bible in there. And I said, well, you can't preach on it all. Just, there's just not enough time. Uh, but, you know, you try to stick to the more uh, practical parts of the Bible. Those are things that we need. And then, too, you have, always have new folks that come in, and they need to hear these foundational truths again. They need to... Uh, kind of, and sometimes we just need reminded if we've had these foundational truths in our own life. So that's kind of what we have here in First John chapter one, verse nine. It says this: If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a gracious, forgiving God. And Lord, I thank you for each one here today. I pray that you will speak to our hearts. I pray that, Lord, we might be changed uh, by the Word of God. And Lord, that we might be drawn closer to you through it all. Lord, if there be any in our service or maybe any that will be watching on Facebook or, or YouTube later, I pray that you will, uh, Lord, if they're not saved, that you will use this message to speak to them so that they get saved. And Lord, they can uh, have a home in heaven for all eternity. Father, I just pray that that will be done now. I pray that you will help uh, settle my mind, my heart as I preach. Give me the words you want me to say. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I, I pray there about the Lord settling my mind and heart. And you know, when you do these services, how we've done them, uh, I, before Dan had asked me this question, I was sitting up here after the opener, and we were singing the first song, and I'm just like, what happens next? Because <laughs> I don't have it written down. I'm just like, uh, I forgot what we do. Because we do the early service a little bit different than we do this service. It's uh, We have an extra song there because we don't have the choir. And uh, so I was drawing a blank. And then Dan asked me, he said, uh, 
How does that next congregational song go? He goes, I've got so many other songs in my head I can't get. <laughs> so I'm glad confusion is not just on my part. And uh, it happens to all of us. But, you know, I'm glad we have a God that understands us. I'm glad we have a God that uh, takes care of us. And, and uh, so if my brain sometimes seems a little scattered, uh, that's what it is. But, you know, I want to, this message here, 1 John 1, 9, this one verse here, this is God's do-over. This is kind of his mulligan. That's why I simply entitled the message, God's mulligan. God gives us uh, do-overs in our life. He, he, he knows that we're sinners. When you get saved, I've asked people the question before, you know, you go out and witness them, you talk to them, you lead them to Christ, and then sometimes I'll ask them the question, i say, now, do you think, and I forgot to turn my mic on, I just realized that too, that'll help with uh, those at home, so make sure it's on, there we go, and, but I asked the question, I said, uh, do you think you're ever going to sin again, and here's the answers, you get uh, three different answers usually, it's like, I said, no, I mean, they think, once they got saved, they're good to go. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> that would be great. And then I've got, got the answers like, because they know themselves, they're like, well, yeah. And then I've got others that really just don't know. They're like, well, because they know themselves, but yet they just got saved, and they're not sure what the Bible teaches and what really happened. So I go, oh, I don't know. And, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in life. But let me tell you this. If you haven't been saved for very long, I don't want to shock you, but you're going to sin again. It's going to happen just as much as you're taking in air and breathing is happening. You're going to sin again. Now, we should try not to sin. We should strive not to sin. And God has given us the, the ability to have victory over sin. But things are going to happen. You're going, uh, you're going to sin. Uh, I was studying for tonight's message. Tonight's message is going to be uh, on how to love and how to be loved. And uh, I was studying for that message. It's going through some things. And boy, I tell you what, I hit one of those points that just totally smote my heart. I'm like, oh, Lord, I do this. And I do it probably, you know, when I'm driving, you know, more than any other time. Uh, it just, it convicted me. And I was like, you know, every time I do it, I'm sinning. And I need to be careful. And, and what I'm doing uh, is just getting frustrated with other people. You know, I need to realize God's in control. And, and it's not my task. It's the main important thing for me to get from there to there. And I just need to... Uh, just let God work in hearts and lives and let God work in my own life and, and not be such an impatient driver. But, you know, sometimes we just overcomplicate the Bible. And when we do that, we miss the power that is in God's Word. And here in 1 John 1, 9, there's a lot of, a lot of powerful truths here. And I'm going to look at three of them. Powerful truths we find here in this passage. So first of all, we want to see our confession. Our confession says, if we confess our Sins. Now, this is written to believers. Uh, we can go back up and study the whole first chapter here, but this passage is clearly written to believers. And it says that we confess our sins. And I've got uh, under that S after sin, that little S there, it makes it plural, I've got that really underlined because it's not just that we confess our sin generally, we confess our sins specifically. That's what we do. You know what you've done. It's not a good thing to say, well, Lord, just forgive me for the sins I've done today. No. Stop and say, Lord, I need you to search my heart. I want you to start pinpointing sins that I've done. And especially if you know you've just sinned, confess it immediately. Keep a keep clean slate with God. With God don't, uh, don't let that thing go on and on and on. And then maybe at the end of the day, well, Lord, just kind of wipe, wipe it off clean now. Don't do it that way. That's not good. It's not doing you any good. Uh, we need to confess our sins specifically. You know you've had a bad attitude. You know maybe you said something harsh to somebody. Uh, or maybe you got frustrated over something or whatever it is. Just stop right then and there and confess it to God. And I'll talk a little bit more about what confession is. But uh, Romans 7.13 says this. It says that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. We need to realize how God looks at our sin. We try to dress sin up in all kinds of different ways. We have we call uh, drunkards, we call them alcoholics. They're a drunkard. That's the Bible term. Uh, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. We try to say things about lies. We say, well, that's a little, minimize it, white, that makes it look holy and pure, lie. 
It's a little white lie. No, it's an abomination to God. The devil's the father of lies. And that was one message we preached, I think, last Sunday night about uh, lying, one of the Ten Commandments. And uh, we do this all the time, but we need to see sin for what it is. It is exceeding sinful to God. So we need to confess it. And the word confession itself basically means agree. We need to agree with God. Now, sometimes the problem is we maybe don't understand exactly to whom we're to confess. We always should confess our sin to God uh, or exactly how we should confess it. But again, I think you need to stick specifically when you're confessing sins. It's good sometimes, and I've done this myself, is you know when I'm praying and say, Lord, I just need you to search my heart because you know, your brain gets clouded with a lot of different things, and sometimes you're not thinking of anything specifically. But Lord, if there's something that I've done that maybe I'm not aware of, search my heart, bring it to my mind, I need to confess it, I want to have a clean heart before you, and you just stop and listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And God will bring something across your mind if there's something there. And when He does, confess it immediately. Get it taken care of. So confession is to agree with God about two basic things. You agree with God about your actions, and you agree with God about your intentions. I used to think uh, a long time ago that, well, as long as my intentions are good, it doesn't matter what I did, it's just as long as, as, long as I, I meant to do well. <laughs> well, we'll see what God says about that. There's uh, When our actions, this is kind of common sense here, when our actions are wrong and our intentions are wrong, Common sense says, and God calls it that, he said, that's just wicked. You mean to hurt people, you mean to do wrong, and you do wrong, that's wicked. But there's a couple of these that we're going to look at here that uh, are not quite so obvious. If my actions are wrong, but my intentions are good, I meant well. What does God think about that? Well, God says it's wicked. If your actions are wrong, but you meant well, it's still wicked. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. So if our actions are wrong and our intentions are wrong, that's wicked. If 
If our actions are wrong and our intentions are good, that's still wicked. And if our actions are good, we do the right thing, but our intentions are wrong, guess what God says about that? Still wicked. We have in Matthew chapter 7, you don't have to turn there, Matthew 7, verse 21 and 23, Jesus is preaching there on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, in Matthew 7, verse 21 and 23, we find a group of people, and this is a, a very sad portion of Scripture. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? We could probably put some other things to that list. Have we not taught Sunday school in thy name? Have we not been faithful to church? Have we not done this and not done that? And Jesus is going to say these sad words. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Sad words. Their actions were right, but their intentions were wrong. You say, what could their intentions be? Well, I don't know what their intentions might have been. Some people try to work their way to heaven. They think they're a good old boy or a good old gal, and they just try to be a good person. They think, well, if I'm good enough, I'll get there. No one's going to be in heaven that way. Yeah. It is only through the blood of Jesus yeah. that any person is going to get to heaven. Yeah. And we need to realize that. So if, if that was your intent was, well, I just need to try to do right by other people, and that'll get me there. Well, you can try to do right by other people. That's okay. But if you're leaving Jesus Christ out of the picture, that's not okay. That's a bad intention. But I know also there are people who, in churches, and when we went to uh, Temple Baptist Church down in Knoxville, Tennessee, we were down there for five years before we moved here, and we went down there. That church is a huge church. It's, uh, it probably runs two, 3,000 uh, easily on a Sunday morning, uh, and probably pretty close to that 6,200 maybe on a Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, big church. Uh, there's six different doors you can go into the auditorium. Three on this side, three on that side. And uh, the church is broken up into 12 sections. And that, that's how, what section do you see that you sit in? Well, I sit in section 11 or section 3. And uh, so they're all numbered by, they're all like little churches. And uh, one, one little section is about the size of our whole church. Uh, that's just, that would be a little section. And uh, so we went there probably, we were there for five years, went there for about a year and a half. And uh, we were still, every time we would go through a different door or we would sit in a different section, People come up and they introduce themselves to us and say, oh, are you all visiting with us? Because they get visitors all the time. I was like, no, we, we joined here about a year and a half ago. And you just, it wasn't like a small church field. Uh, you were always coming across people that uh, you thought, were well, these people visiting or are they not visiting you? And uh, you just didn't get to know. But what I started to tell you was this. You learn how to play the church game in a hurry. And I already knew how to play the church game. You say, what's church game? Church game is... You want to get into a position of authority. You want to, and this is sad this this way, but it's like this in a lot of churches. Uh, it's like uh, when Dan and Bethany first came here. Uh, their very first, I think it was a Wednesday night you all came. And, uh, first Wednesday night, I found out Dan was an assistant pastor. Most pastors, when they find out something like that, oh, you're an assistant pastor? Oh, you definitely need to come. And they, they will press you. They'll put the, you know, they, they want you to join. They want to get you plugged in right away. Why? Because they need laborers. They need help. Here's somebody who has worked in the ministry. Let's get them in. Let's plug them in. And let's get them going right away. That's a bad thing to do. And as a matter of fact, I told Dan that. I said, well, I know you've been in the ministry, but uh, and a lot of guys we want to get you in and, and want you to join right away. Just, I said, but I know our church is the only one in town. You need to pray where God wants you. And if God leads you here and then he wants you to serve, well, you got to get to know the people. they got to get to know you. We'll just see how it works out. I think that's the best way to do it. And just see how things take place. Of course, God's uh, been good to them and been good to us happening here. And uh, But, you know, at this particular church, the Temple, when we got down there, I had been in the ministry for uh, a period of time already, about 11 years. And I, I thought, well, I'll get down there. And, you know, I may get on staff. I don't know what will happen. I don't know if we go down and they want me to teach, you know, in the college or teach in, the, in uh, Christian school or what. And... Uh, Got down there and knew exactly what I needed to do. If I wanted to get in good with the pastor, I knew to show up at the workers' meeting, show up for soul winning, just make yourself be seen. Now, whether or not you actually went out and did anything, that was a whole different story. But I'm saying there are people down there who did stuff like this, and I knew it because I saw it. There was a guy I went soul winning with him. Uh, as long as he got his couple business in, he was fine. He was ready to move on. Uh, his dad eventually became uh, 
one of the, he was just, I'm not going to tell you who it was because if it gets back, I don't want it to get back to them, but he just got promoted up the ranks. And what this young guy was doing, he was learning to play the church game. He was learning to be seen in it. That's somebody who's doing the right actions, but has the wrong motive. You want a pat on the back? It's good to be encouraged, but you're doing it for the wrong reasons. The only person you ought to be concerned about getting a pat on the back from is God Almighty. What God sees in secret, He will reward openly. But if you get your reward amongst men, well, barely you have your reward. That's it. That's all you're going to get. So we don't do things to be seen of men. We don't do things just to be up in front of people. That's not our motive. That's not our intent. We should not be doing things that way. What we should be doing is just wanting to serve the Lord. Now, when I got down there in that church, I purposed I was not going to do that. They had a huge bus ministry. Uh, they actually had two bus ministries at the time. One, I think they had about 16 buses, something like that. Uh, one pick the kids up for the early service, the early Sunday school, and then we, they would go out again and pick kids up for the afternoon church. We had afternoon church there. It was usually about uh, 1.30, and we'd have church till about 3, and that was with the uh, inner city bus kids. Uh, we had that. So uh, there's a lot of things. And some of those bus drivers, that's all they did all day long, just drive the bus. You know, they go pick up, drop them off, and go back out, pick them up, and drop them off. And, uh, and boy, I tell you what, it was, just, it was a lot of work to get involved in. And I, and I kept going down there, and this is the crazy thing. I knew it would be easy to find a job to do down there, or at least so I thought, because I had the wrong motive. And God actually had to convict me of that, and I had to confess it to him, because my motive was I just thought, well, here I am. I've been in the ministry 11 years. Put me to work. I'm ready to go. And God says, no, you're not. I kept asking, hey, is there something I can help here? Something I can help here? They're always looking for labor. Do you know how our church is? We're always looking for people who are willing to step in and serve and do something. And that's a good thing. But there was nothing I couldn't get in anywhere. It took me about seven, eight months before finally I just gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, do you want me to do something here? I just need you to show me. I mean, I was going to the workers' meeting. I was going uh, solar. I was doing other things. But it's just... I couldn't get plugged anywhere. But the thing is, God had to show me my motive was all wrong. I was doing it, and I didn't realize it. I thought I was doing it for God, but that's how the seat for our heart is. I was doing it, and I was actually in the church game without even realizing I was in the church game. I was going to be seen as it. And really, the only one I need to be concerned about was pleasing God. So you see, if our actions are wrong and our intentions are wrong, God says it's wicked. If our actions are wrong and our intentions are good, God says it's wicked. If our actions are good and our intentions are wrong, God still says that's wicked. But if our actions are good and our intentions are good, that's what God calls righteous. So when we sin, who do we confess to? What do we confess? Well, you ought to always confess your sin to God. Why? Because every sin is against God. Every sin is against God. And even when David sinned, he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. But you know, he had sinned and done other things. You know, but our sin is always against God. But here's another thing. If you have hurt somebody, or you have offended somebody, and you know you have, then you need to confess to them. Now, remember, confess is agreeing. You're agreeing you have done wrong. So in uh, James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So if you have hurt somebody else, you need to confess that sin to them. But let me say this, and this is for the married couples out there, uh, and you are that are not married yet, hopefully you'll learn this early. But ladies, you hear me say this all the time, guys are done. Okay? Guys are really, 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 really done. And when I say they're really, really, really done, it's like, and this, it took Becky a while because she said this to me a time or two until she learned that I was just dumb. <laughs> I really didn't know. Uh, I would look at her and I would know something wasn't quite right. You, the jaw was a little tighter. She wasn't talking as much. I was like, something's wrong here. Uh, something wrong with you, honey? What makes you ask that? <laughs> Well, I can feel the darts coming my way. <laughs> well, apparently there is something wrong here. <laughs> so, well, you just seem different. Well, watch 
be different. And as we get talking, it's like, you know, did I do something? Did I say something? And here's the thing that would come out of the mouth. Well, you ought to know what you did. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you don't know what you did. And you know what? Sometimes the shoe goes on the other foot. Sometimes you ladies might say something or do something to hurt your husbands. And you don't know what you did. But God made guys a little different. Sometimes guys, guys can overlook it a little bit easier than women. But you know what? Sometimes you hurt people unintentionally. That's the thing we need to get at. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes when people are hurt or offended, they don't know that they've hurt or offended you. And they don't just get it. They don't just know. Oh, well, I know they did that one. You don't know anything. Quit trying to read people's minds because God didn't make us to where we could read people's minds. We don't, we can't assume that. It's a dangerous thing to assume that. Matter of fact, the devil will use that in your life to cause turmoil and havoc into your own life. But when people, uh, when we know, when we come to terms and we know that we've hurt somebody uh, or we have offended somebody, what we need to do is we need to confess it to them and to God. Now, your intentions may have been good. But your actions are what you need to focus on. Sometimes it's the, the tone of your voice, how you say something. It's not what you said. What you said was fine, but it was how you said it. Or it's the facial expression. It's the nonverbal communication. Hey, honey, could you come here and do this? Oh. And that was something Becky had. I had to work on one, not going so much, but she had to realize I wasn't going because she was asking me to help. It's just like... Oh, because I knew I was getting, I get distracted, and I've got to refocus. It takes a lot of work for me to refocus. And uh, I'm like, oh, and she's like, you don't have to know. I'm like, what? I didn't realize I rolled my eyes. And I'm like, what? And she's like, well, you just, you just rolled your eye. I was oh. And when I realize I did that, it's good for me to confess it. Well, I'm sorry to be in the show that I had bad. I said, I wasn't frustrated at you. Or I might even be focused on something else and get frustrated, and she thinks it's towards her because of something she said. No, no, no. Make sure you confess your sin. doesn't matter if your actions uh, are, are bad and your intentions are good. Confess it and say, you know what? I didn't mean to say it that way. Don't, and don't, don't apologize like this. Please don't apologize. This is so bad. And you need to get out of this habit. I'm sorry if I hurt you. Don't do that. Because obviously you did hurt them. And that is trying to make that sounds, and you're not maybe not doing this or thinking you're doing this, but what you're doing is actually making an excuse. I'm sorry if I did this, you know, I'm better than that, you ought to be better than that, get over it, you know, suck it up, you know, type thing. That's what it sounds like. No. Is that how you're going to confess to God when you sin? I sure hope not. I hope that you're humble. I hope that you are repentant. You're ready to change your ways. You're ready to try not to do that again. It's the same way when we go to other people and ask them to forgive us. Don't say, I'm sorry if I hurt you. And then don't say this either. And I hope you don't do this. I'm sorry I hurt you, but I was just having a bad day. Keep the butt out of it. It doesn't matter if you're having a bad day. You hurt them. You said the wrong thing. That's making excuses for your actions. Matter of fact, I had somebody tell me one time, says, you know, uh, and I was thankful they did this because they did, did it the right way. They were hurt by something I did, and I was completely oblivious to it. I had no idea that actually it was something I didn't do, something I didn't do hurt them. And uh, they came to me and said, you know, Pastor, just wants you to know, uh, we wonder why we were kind of hurt because, you know, this didn't happen. And, and we were talking about it. And right away, I mean, I know I'm busy. I'm, I'm like, feel like I'm torn in a million directions, and sometimes I don't know which way I'm spinning. And, uh, and right away, I want to say, I mean, if they had any idea what was going on in my life at that time, it's like I wanted to start saying, oh, you know, I was doing this, this, and this, and poop. And I just said that. I said, I just want to apologize to you. There's no excuse. I said, no matter what I tell you, it's going to sound like an excuse. And there is no excuse. And I just want you to know, I definitely would not intend to hurt you. I don't intend to hurt anyone. I said, I know it happens. I know you were hurt. Would you please forgive me? I'll try to change the, what I just did. I just try to change the future. And they said, that's fine. So said, maybe brought up again. That was it. And it was done in a biblical way. But don't 
justify yourself. No matter how justified you may be, don't make excuses for it. Because if we've hurt somebody, we have the responsibility to make it right and to confess that to them. Again, your actions, if both your actions are right and your intentions are right, there's nothing to confess. But usually one or the other are the wrong thing. Your actions might have been right, but your intentions are wrong, or usually it's your actions uh, that were wrong and your intentions were right. But God still says, no, it's wrong. We need to confess it. So confess it first to God, confess your sins to Him, and then confess it to one another. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. If you're not going to prosper, you try to cover your sin, pretend like it doesn't happen. You sweep things under the rug, guess what? You can only get so much dirt under the rug. When I was a kid, we used to put, uh, my mom and dad said, clean your room. And it's me and my brother, so we clean our room. We shove all of our dirty clothes in the closet or under the bed. And then one day, we couldn't close the closet door. <laughs> There's only so many dirty clothes that can go in the closet. There's only so many dirty clothes that can go under the thing, you know, under the bed. And uh, after a while, they start sticking out. You see the, the blanket, when the blanket's coming in, you make the bed, you see the blanket kind of bulging out. There's only so much they can get there. And guess what? You don't prosper. If we would have taken the same amount of energy and effort, I wish I understood that then, to do it the right way, we wouldn't have had to redo it all over again. And that's the way it is. If you just confess your sin and deal with it, uh, get it out there, deal with it correctly the first time, and then you won't have to repeat the same thing. So confess your sin to God, confess it to others when you've hurt or offended them, but also... Let me say this, when, what happens when you're confronted with your past? How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you have something in your past that you wish wasn't there? <laughs> I think probably it was. Yeah. There's something there that we wish we'd have done differently. But guess what? We can't go back and change that. Now, the devil wants to do this. The devil wants to keep throwing your past up, throwing your past up, throwing your past up, because he knows it's going to defeat you. Don't let them defeat you. So what happens when somebody confronts you with your past? And say, or they bring up something from your past. First of all, you don't have to be, I want to say this where it sounds correctly, uh, it's not ashamed of your past. You may be ashamed of the things you did, but use your past to the glory of God. Yes, that's who I was, but that's not who I am now. I have been changed. God has changed me. I told many of you the story when I worked at, at Cracker Barrel years ago, and I had been in church. God had called me to preach. Uh, my older sister was not in church at the time. She was just, a uh, matter of fact, I think she had just gotten out of jail probably six, seven, eight months before that. And uh, and she was, you know, telling, I'd been witnessing to the wait staff, the waitresses and the waiters, and uh, some other people there at the restaurant. And uh, I came back for break one time, and they were all back there in the break room. And as soon as I came in, all the eyes turned and looked at me. It's like, whoa, I've heard all these stories about you. And my sister was back there just telling them all these stories where I'd go out drinking, doing all this other stuff, and all my, my wild times. And, and uh, right away, I felt shame. But then I thought, nah, that's who I once was. That's not who I am now. And so I say this, when you're confronted with your past with others, you can confess and you can agree with them. That's what confession is. You're agreeing with them, but be very cautious. I said, you know, you're right. That's Those stories are true. What she told you was true. And they were like, oh, I can't believe it. I said, but she didn't tell you the whole story. That's who I was before I met Christ. That's who I was before I realized what God had done in my life. And you know, all those times that I've been out partying, I said, you all know what I'm talking about. You've been out there, you've been to the parties, you've been riding around with your friends, everybody really laughing, smiling, having a big time, but inside you're just as empty as can be. And boy, I tell you, about that time you can hear a pin drop in that room. I said, you know, when you're by yourself and you're wondering, is this all life is? Is this all there, there is to it? Is, you know, what's it all about anyway? I said, that emptiness, that void that's there, I found out when Jesus Christ can fill that up. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. That's why he's changing me. And I took that situation, and, and by the grace of God, I'm glad God led me that, but it taught me a lesson. I took that situation 
where my, I was confronted with my past and turned it around to the glory of God. But you know what? I couldn't have been able to do that if I was still living in that sin. If I was still struggling with that stuff, I couldn't have been able to do that. But when God sets us free we, and, we, and we're confronted with our past and uh, somebody throws something up, be very discreet. I didn't have to go into all the details. I didn't have to fill in all the extra the spaces that my sister left out. But what I had to do was just simply realize that God sometimes takes those opportunities and he'll use those opportunities to humble us. And it's good to be humble. It's good to realize how much we need him. We couldn't do this life on our own. So it's good to be humble, but uh, realize God uses those opportunities to humble us. And, and we need to use that same opportunity to give God the glory. That's what we need to do. So that's confessing your sin. But let me hit here quickly God's compassion. 1 John 1, 9, we see this verse here. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He is faithful and just. Why? Because God will forgive. He'll forgive anything. There's nobody that is so far gone, that is so far beyond hope or help, that God cannot rescue and God cannot save. Aren't you excited about that? I'm glad even as a Christian. I was saved as a young child. And then didn't grow up in church, didn't really know what was right. Going my own way, just as confused and blinded as I can be. But I'm thankful I was never beyond hope. As long as there's breath in your body, there is hope. We have a loving, merciful, and gracious God. He is quick and ready to forgive if we would just seek Him. Now, there may be things in your life that you have uh, scarred your life with. I had some sisters that uh, they got pregnant before marriage. God can't go back and fix that. But what God can do is take that and use it for the glory of God from that point forward. You can't always change your past. Matter of fact, you can never change your past. But you can change your present and future and use those opportunities in the past. Use them for the glory of God. So don't let the devil beat you off your past. There's, there's been men I've known that have uh, they've been great preachers. They, they fill pulpits, and uh, now they're divorced. They are completely disqualified. Disqualified because their family, uh, you know, family's in ruins. Wife doing whatever, uh, you know, or the ex-wife doing whatever, children doing whatever, it doesn't matter. But complete, their ministry's ruined. But you know what? God's not done with them. They may not be able to ever pastor again, but they can teach a Sunday school class. They can run a bus route. They can be faithful in, in church. They can be uh, one of the godly men in church. They may not be able to be a deacon, but there's a lot of things they can do still. Why? Because as long as there's breath, there's hope. You see, that's the loving, gracious God. Now, some of you may not understand uh, as far as being disqualified to be uh, a pastor or a deacon. Well, that's a, a message for another time. But those are qualifications found in First Timothy and Second Timothy and also the book of Titus. But uh, we see here in this verse, we see... Uh, our confession, we see God's compassion, and then lastly, we see our cleansing. And this is so, so very important. Whatever we've done, whatever sin, however little, and I say and I say little sin, because that's what we do, we minimize it. Remember that sin by the commandment might be exceeding sinful. Whether we think it's a little sin, it's a big sin to God, and we need to confess it as such. So whether we, we think we've committed a little sin or some big sin, some big atrocious sin, whatever it is, we need to make sure that we go to God and we go to Him and ask Him to forgive us and to cleanse us. Now, I want to say this here because I didn't say this in the first part of the confession. If your sin is public knowledge, in other words, the whole community knows about your sin, you need to confess it publicly. If your sin is a private sin, you confess it privately between you and God. If it's between you and an individual, you confess it to God and to that individual. If it's to a group of individuals, you confess it to God and to that group of individuals. But if it's public knowledge everywhere, you confess it publicly. That's how you deal with it. You say, well, that's, that would be embarrassing. Yes, that's the point. It's not supposed to be not embarrassing. You're not supposed to not have shame. You're supposed to have shame. And when we do that, I tell you what, you will feel a freedom and a weight lifted off your shoulders like you've never felt before. 
But if you remember that, if you've committed sin, nobody knows about it but you and God. You only confess it to God. You commit a sin when you against somebody else or you and somebody else know about it, you confess it to them and to God. But you do it publicly, you commit sin publicly, you confess it publicly. That's how it's done. But we see here our cleansing. Let me say this here, and you've heard me say this before, uh, you've heard other preachers maybe say this, but as long as there's breath in your body, there is still hope for you. There's still hope for me. I think of many examples through the Bible. I think of Jacob. Jacob, when Jacob uh, got away from God, Jacob's name means deceiver. And in the Old Testament there, when he got away from God and it seemed like his life was falling apart, guess what he did? He went back to Bethel. He went back to the place where he started his walk with the Lord, and he called upon God there. You see, you can always go back to the beginning. Remember what it says in Revelation chapter 2? In Revelation chapter 2, it talks about uh, the church in Ephesus, how they were doing all these wonderful things, these good things. And he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He says, repent and do the first works. In other words, repent, go back to Bethel. Repent, go back to where it all started. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee and remove thy candlestick out of this place. So we need to realize that God is a forgiving God. We just need to get back to the beginning. Jonah was given a second chance. Jonah, as he was writing there, I like what it says in the book of Jonah, that God prepared a storm. God prepared a fish. Yeah, he prepared all these things to get a hold of Jonah and change Jonah. And then Jonah, because he was a preacher of God, he was a prophet of God, and he refused to go preach to these people, he finally ended up going and preached to those people. And guess who wrote the book of Jonah? Jonah. If we had a chance to write our life story and have it uh, forever put in eternity under the inspiration of God, do you think we would write the good, the bad, and the ugly? Jonah did. How many people have been helped and encouraged through the book of Jonah? God gave him a second chance. I think of Moses. Moses, at 40 years old, he killed an individual. And he thought the Israelites would understand. He could have killed an Egyptian. thought the Israelites would understand. And then he fled for his life for 40 years. Fled for his life, spent his life in the backside of the wilderness. 80 years of age, God recalls him to basically be the prophet to Israel. Calls him to the middle. You're never beyond hope. He became a prophet to Israel for the next 40 years. I think of Samson, how Samson, Samson did a lot of things wrong. Samson, though, when he finally uh, you know, had sinned there with uh, you know, Delilah, he lost his power, he lost of course, his hair, he lost everything, he lost his testimony, and had his eyes put out. And then at the end of his life, he just he prayed and cried out to God for his mercy for one more chance, one more opportunity. God gave him his strength again, and he killed more of his enemy in his death than he did in his life. God's a merciful God. I think of Peter, how Peter was restored when, when he denied Christ. Can you imagine denying Christ three times? Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. Uh, everybody else might forsake you, but I'm not going to. I'll fight for you to the death. And then he denies the Lord three times, and the Bible tells us that when he denied him the third time, the eyes of the Lord turn and look at Peter. Can you imagine the look of disappointment? Oh, how that smoked Peter's heart. The Bible says he went out. Here's a grown, strong fisherman. He went out and wept bitterly. Thought he had ruined everything. Christ went on to the cross. He was crucified. He was buried. He rose from the dead the third day. Peter still confused, thinking all hope was lost. Confused about what it all means as I go fishing. He didn't know what else to do, so go fishing. That's what he did. He was a fisherman by trade. He went fishing. And while he was out fishing, the Lord came to him again and restored him back to his ministry. And there's a lot of things in that story I'd like to get into about Peter and how God restored him back to his ministry. But what I want you to understand is God's a merciful God. Whatever you've done, you've never, you cannot go too far, you cannot go too far away from God where God doesn't know exactly where you're at. You might be running from God here this morning. You can't get very far. It's kind of like an ant. We had an ant on our countertop. And I was watching this ant, I thought, I was looking around to see if he had any friends around. I didn't see any friends. I mean, it's a little, little kind of ant. And I just kind of went like this, put my hand down like I was going to kill it, and this thing started running. I mean, it's just those little legs just fast and good. I'm just sitting there watching it. That's like us and God.
God, you can't run very far. You can't run very fast. Because God sees all this earth is just footstool. Where are you going to get? Hey, the place we ought to get, we ought to always go to the Lord. Confess our sins. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. Oh, that cleansing is so important. We need that cleansing. We need that fresh beginning, that new start. If you need a new start today, we'd love to help you with that. Maybe you are here and you're not sure Jesus Christ has ever saved you. Maybe you're not sure uh, you've ever done it right. We'd love to show you what the Bible says and you can get it settled once and for all. Won't you come so we can help you? Or maybe you have another need. You just need to come pray at the altar. The altar's open. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer and then have a song of invitation. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. I thank you for these dear folks here, and I pray that you will help us, Lord, to live for you. I pray that you help us to confess our sins as you teach us to do so, and confess them specifically, not generally. Lord, our hearts are just very, very wicked. Our, when we got saved, our flesh never got saved, and we have to die to it each and every day, sometimes several times a day. He just wants to have his way again. Father, I pray that we will always walk in the Spirit so we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And Father, I pray that uh, Lord, there might be someone here who's dealing with something specific. Maybe they've just been struggling with their past and the devil has not lit up on them. I pray that they get help today. Lord, that they would just simply uh, confess it, acknowledge it, and then, Lord, use their past to the glory of God. I pray you help them grow in your grace, grow stronger as a believer. And then, Lord, I pray also you will help use our life so we can bring other people to Jesus Christ. But Lord, if there's one in our service today that's not sure of heaven is wrong, we want to give them that opportunity. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, we just simply ask you the question, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? I mean, say, preacher, I'm just not really sure about that. I'm not really sure I'm saved. But I'd like to get that settled here today. I'd like to, and here, I'm going to just tell you how to do it. The Bible says we're all sinners. We all deserve God's wrath. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. If you've committed one sin, it's enough to send you to hell for our eternity. And God loves you. God does not want hell in the lake of fire for you. He wants you to be in heaven with him. That's why Jesus Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross and shed his blood so your sins can be paid in full. And you might have maybe prayed this prayer before, but you might be struggling with it. Let me just encourage you. Nail that thing down once again. Just nail it down. It's not worth struggling with. It's not worth wondering about. Nail it down and pray it again. Just say, Lord Jesus, I might have prayed this before, but I know I mean it right now. As best I know how, I'm asking you to save me and forgive me of my sins. Or maybe you've never prayed that before. You can pray it right now. Dear Jesus, please forgive me for my sins so I can have a home in heaven. Let me just ask you the question. If you prayed that prayer right now, you meant it with all your heart. Would you indicate that by lifting your hand real high so I can see it? Look around, anybody like that? Christian? Let's work on this thing about confessing our sins, first of all to God, and then to others. And let's do it in a biblical way. Let's not make excuses for it. Let's not try to minimize it. Let's just confess it for what it is. Father, bless this invitation time. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 253, as we say. God spoke to you, won't you?